Welcome to the Multiple Sclerosis Virtual Grand Rounds Educational Series. I'm Dr. Alex Ray Grant, Staff Neurologist at the Mellon Center for Multiple Sclerosis at the Cleveland Clinic. I'm the moderator for this series. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Timothy West. Dr. West is a Staff Neurologist and Director of the Multiple Sclerosis Program at the Cleveland Clinic Lou Ruvo Center in Las Vegas, Nevada. He graduated from Brigham Young University and the UC San Francisco Medical School and did his training in neurology and fellowship in MS at UCSF. He was awarded the National MS Society Clinical Training Fellowship Grant. He has published on various topics in MS and related disorders. In this talk, he will present three informative cases to us. These cases were selected to emphasize important aspects of the diagnosis, treatment initiation, and monitoring of MS. There's good evidence that adult learners get more from a case-based approach as well as repeated presentation materials. This talk will be very helpful in defining who is at risk for MS, who may benefit from disease-modifying agents, when a change in treatment should be considered, and what to do for more aggressive cases of MS. In line with Dr. Rudick's presentation on trying to treat to target, this talk will emphasize monitoring for treatment effect, a concept that, while newer in the MS field, has become well-established as the correct present methodology for MS care. Dr. West. I would like to thank Dr. Ray Grant for that introduction. Uh, today we're going to talk about a case-based approach to the treatment and management of multiple sclerosis. Before we begin, the learning objectives uh, that we're uh, aiming at <clears throat> achieving today uh, include correctly identifying patients with clinically isolated syndrome that are at high risk to go on to develop multiple sclerosis, being able to identify disease-modifying treatment failure, and risk factors for poorer prognosis in patients you may see with multiple sclerosis. Also being able to identify important mimics of multiple sclerosis that you don't want to miss. So case one is a 36-year-old Caucasian man who presented after waking up a few days earlier uh, to find that his foot was asleep. Actually, both of them were asleep. By the next day, the numbness had spread to his thighs and his buttocks. Over the next few days, he began to have trouble walking with a feeling of heaviness in his legs. Over the same time, he also noted that the numbness had spread to his abdomen and hands, and he had developed urinary frequency, which he had never had before. Uh, he had no incontinence, and he uh, didn't have any erectile dysfunction either. However, the change in the bladder function was very alarming to him. A cervical spine MRI was ordered by his internist, and he was referred to a neurologist for further evaluation. The MRI, as you can see on the left, there is a T2 axial uh, image of his cervical spine showing uh, an increased T2 signal in the posterior aspect of the cervical spine at C4. And the post-catalinium images, both sagittal and axial, you can see that they did enhance at the time of the image. So the first question that I have, uh, and there will be a few questions throughout this presentation, is the following. The patient is referred to your clinic for a diagnosis and possible treatment options. He has no other pertinent past medical history, family history, or social history, otherwise been a very healthy guy, in fact, was playing basketball the day before this happened. He's currently on no other medications. So the question before you is, what is the correct diagnosis? A, neuromyelitis optica. B, relapsing or remitting multiple sclerosis. C, primary progressive multiple sclerosis. D, clinically isolated syndrome. Or E, radiologically isolated syndrome. So the correct answer here is D. Clinical isolated syndrome is a term widely used in contemporary neurologic practice to describe a first clinical episode in which a patient has symptoms and signs suggestive of inflammatory demyelinating disorders such as multiple sclerosis. The term clinically isolated syndrome is typically applied in a young adult, usually between 20 and 45 years of age, with an episode of acute or subacute onset. It should reach its peak intensity rapidly within the first couple of weeks or even a shorter. Uh, but to be termed clinically isolated syndrome, the episode should last for at least 24 hours and occur in the absence of fever or infection and with no clinical features of encephalopathy. A clinically isolated syndrome is, by definition, always isolated in time, or in other words, it's monophasic. Clinically, it is usually also isolated in space or monofocal, with signs indicating a lesion in the optic nerve a common presentation for CIS studies, the spinal cord, the brainstem, or cerebellum, rarely in the cerebral hemisphere. However, some patients with clinically isolated syndrome have clinical evidence for dissemination in space, 
which would be a multifocal uh, presentation. Clinically multifocal, clinically isolated syndrome presentations could include something like optic neuritis with um, a positive Babinski response or numbness in one limb. These are less common than the monofocal presentation as with this patient here. So the next question is what would you do now that you have the diagnosis of clinically isolated syndrome? What do you do next? A, order an MRI of the brain. B, order a lumbar puncture. C, order an autoimmune lab screen to look for mimics of multiple sclerosis. D, start a disease-modifying therapy, or E, A, B, and C. The answer here is E, A, B, and C, and we'll talk about why that's important. When we did obtain a brain MRI of this patient, uh, this is what we saw. You could see there is one isolated T2 hyperintense lesion that is radiating perpendicularly out from the ventricle in a pattern consistent with a Dawson finger, which is traditionally associated with multiple sclerosis. There were no other lesions in the brain, and this image uh, did not show enhancement. This was a, a non-enhancing T2 lesion. Why that is important is because in 2008, Fisniku, uh, Dr. Fisniku and his colleagues, demonstrated that over 20 years of follow-up, the presence of a single demyelinating lesion in the brain at onset conferred an 80% risk of going on to develop another attack, and thus a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. As such, the presence of even one lesion in this patient demonstrates that he has an increased risk for going on to develop multiple sclerosis and would therefore be a high-risk clinically isolated syndrome. These are the patients we absolutely want to put on disease-modifying therapy as soon as possible. Of note, in the original CHAMPS study, which was a pivotal trial uh, uh, that was submitted to the FDA for uh, indication of interferon beta-1A intramuscular injections, for CIS indication, the requirement to enter that trial was two MRI lesions at baseline for entry. As such, an isolated myelitis with no brain lesions would not have qualified for that study. The next slide talks about the lumbar puncture and why that's important. In this particular individual, he had zero white blood cells, zero red blood cells, a glucose and protein that were normal, but he did have positive oligoclonal bands that were unique to the CSF and not found in the corresponding serum sample. His IgG index was normal, and he had a negative autoimmune laboratory screen, including um, Lyme, B12, uh, autoimmune antibodies such as ANA, SSA, SSB, anticardiolipin, IgG, and IgM, uh, and uh, serum ACE. So the question is, why is that important? Well, McDonald criteria which was amended in 2010, states that for the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis, it requires, quote, no better explanation, quote, to be found for the clinical presentation. The differential diagnosis for possible multiple sclerosis includes infectious, neoplastic, congenital, metabolic, uh, vascular, or non-MS, idiopathic, inflammatory, demyelinating diseases, and these need to be evaluated prior to making a diagnosis of MS. I have clinically seen many patients that looked like MS, uh, felt like MS. On imaging, it uh, seemed like they were very consistent with MS, but when you do the laboratory screens, they turned out to have lupus or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or some other variant, and as such, these do need to be evaluated. In this patient, the laboratory screen was negative, but the lumbar puncture did show positive oligoclonal bands. So I want to talk for just a moment about what that is and what that means. This is an idealized picture of what an oligocl oligoclonal band pattern may look like in a lab. If you look on the far left, that first column there shows two bars there. The one on the left is uh, supposed to be the serum. The one on the right with the little asterisk indicates the cerebrospinal fluid. And essentially what's happening here is you take a, a, piece, a drop of the spinal fluid and you place it on that right column and a drop of the serum and you place it on the left column and then you run an electric current through this uh, electrophoresis paper. As such, the waves of the electricity as they conduct through the paper will separate out proteins based on weight. The proteins that weigh the most will stay where they are. The proteins that weigh the least will be pushed down the field. So in a normal patient, somebody who has no infection, no autoimmune disease, uh, and no other uh, you know, inflammatory condition, there would be no oligoclonal band pattern seen. Just a, a nice little smear there. 
Now, just on that second column, you'll see somebody who is identified with an infection uh, or a systemic autoimmune disease. They're generating antibodies and proteins all over their body, both in this uh, cerebrospinal fluid and in the serum. So as a result, you're going to get identical band patterns uh, in these two columns. This finding is not definitive for multiple sclerosis, as this can be seen in any CNS inflammatory condition leading to compartmentalized inflammation, such as neurosarcoidosis or neurosyphilis. Any kind of inflammatory condition can lead to this kind of a finding. However, in the absence of any other uh, sign of a, a different inflammatory disease or any infection, this is highly suggestive of multiple sclerosis. This last pattern here on the right is often seen in multiple sclerosis as well. What you see is, in, uh, is oligoclonal bands found both in the serum and in the CSF. However, there are here now one, two, three bands more in the CSF than found in the serum. This would be read out as three bands unique to the CSF but not found in the corresponding serum sample. So again, again, the question um, is then, what does this mean for me? I've now found that this pattern is here. Does this have any uh, bearing on whether or not this patient be treated or will have a risk to go on to get multiple sclerosis? And the answer was uh, described by Dr. Tintore in an article in Neurology published in 2008, which showed that when you have a patient with clinically isolated syndrome who has positive oligoclonal bands found in the CSF but not in the corresponding serum, serum sample, it confers an increased risk of going on to develop multiple sclerosis with a hazard ratio of 1.7. As such, this too would qualify a patient for a diagnosis of high-risk clinically isolated syndrome and would indicate that this patient should be treated with disease-modifying therapy. So the learning points from this case are that there is a difference between high-risk clinically isolated syndrome and low-risk clinically isolated syndrome. In this case, this gentleman had a a transverse myelitis, or more correctly, a partial transverse myelitis. Um, the autoimmune lab screen was negative for another cause, uh, but because he had positive CSF and a lesion on his brain MRI, this put him at a higher risk to go on to clinically isolated syndrome. As such, uh, I would recommend at this time that this patient be placed on disease-modifying therapy. The CSF being positive confers a hazard ratio of 1.7 for the development of MS over the next four years. And a brain MRI showing a single lesion confers an 80% chance that he will go on to develop MS over the next 20 years. Case number two. This patient is a 19-year-old Caucasian woman who suffered from an acute onset of nausea in April of 2009 that lasted for weeks and led to 25 pounds of unintentional weight loss over four to five weeks. This then resolved spontaneously. In April of 2010, a year later, the patient had blurred vision, in her right eye associated with nausea and pain, especially on movement. A month later, she developed another blurring in the left eye that was associated with pain, especially on the movement of the eye. At this point, she was treated with high-dose corticosteroids, and within three days, uh, she had a great uh, resolution of her symptoms. A few months later in July, she had another bout of neurologic symptoms with imbalance a burning sensation over her chest and upper back that she described as feeling like she had a really bad sunburn. She was again treated with corticosteroids. By this time, of course, she has been diagnosed with relapsing remitting multiple sclerosis, but due to the repetitive attacks, she has yet to be started on a disease-modifying therapy and is referred to your uh, clinic for treatment options. Of note, uh, she has no allergies. Uh, she has only been on the prednisone and, and acid owing to the prednisone causing gastroesophageal uh, reflux disease. Uh, past medical history only notable for a mild flow murmur, which she's had since infancy. Uh, social history is that she's a college freshman, has traditionally done very well in school, but since this is all going on, is not doing well in her freshman year of college. She lives with her parents currently, denies any tobacco, drug, or alcohol use. Her mother has Crohn's disease, her father has hypertension, and she has a fraternal twin sister with pseudotumor cerebri. From a review assistant's point of view, uh, she currently has only nausea, slightly blurred vision on the left, and otherwise no current neurologic symptoms. On examination, uh, blood pressure is slightly elevated at 148 over 82, heart rate was 60, and her respiratory rate was 12. In general, she's very pleasant, appropriate, and interactive. Her neck was supple with no carotid bruise, 
Uh, she had a regular rate and rhythm on her cardiovascular evaluation, but did have the flow murmur as uh, per her past medical history. Her lungs were cleared to auscultation with no wheezes, rails, or ronchi. Her abdomen was soft and non-tender. She had no clubbing, cyanosis, or edema, and there was no rash. On neurologic examination, cognitive function was grossly intact, and she was able to provide a clear and lucid history. Cranial nerves were positive for a slightly impaired vision with 20-40 acuity on the left on near card evaluation. She had a left-sided disc pallor. The right was normal on fundoscopic evaluation. Other cranial nerves were intact. Uh, motor function uh, demonstrated normal bulk and tone with full strength throughout. Uh, she even had normal uh, fast finger taps and uh, fast foot, ta foot taps. Coordination revealed normal finger-nose-finger -finger evaluation, uh, normal heel-knee shin, and rapid alternating movements that were normal. Uh, her Romberg test was also notably negative. Reflexes were 2 plus throughout, and she had down-going toes on Babinski testing. Her gait was normal, narrow-based, and she was able to heel, toe, and tandem walk without difficulty. On sensory evaluation, she had slightly decreased temperature sensation in the right, upper, and lower extremities, but vibration and joint position sense were intact. She was able to walk 25 feet in 4.3 seconds without the use of an assistive device, and on exam today, she had an EDSS score of 2.0 owing to the sensory aberration and the visual acuity dysfunction. Her MRI at the time of presentation demonstrates these T2 hyperintense lesions on the pawns coming off of the fourth ventricle, as you can see on the left, uh, and then also uh, a few scattered T2 hyperintense lesions in the subcortical and deep white matter of the brain. She's had recent labs and studies prior to coming to your clinic, which demonstrate uh, visual evoked potential showing prolonged latency of the P100 on the left. She had a CSF profile done after a lumbar puncture. However, the CSF profile uh, was unavailable. She did, however, have one uh, document demonstrating seven oligoclonal bands unique to the CSF, not found in the corresponding serum, and a mildly elevated IgG index at 0 0.7. Uh, other MS mimics and autoimmune lab screen had been negative, including a perineoplastic panel. Uh, and of note, the patient was JC virus antibody positive. At the time, the patient was started on glatiram or acetate after a great deal of discussion with the patient and the patient's family. And she returned to clinic three months later, reporting that she'd had a reemergence of lightheadedness, nausea, and headache. She'd been treated by a local physician with corticosteroids and, again, had had some improvement of her symptoms. But on exam, she had new vibration sensory loss, mild dysmetria on finger-nose finger testing, mild gait ataxia, and inability to perform tandem walk. Of note, I had written the prescription for uh, glatiram or acetate three months prior, but it took a couple of months for insurance to get it to her, so she'd only actually been on it for a few weeks. And this happens frequently in clinic where they come back three months later, but they've really only been on medicine for a few weeks. So her MRI at the time showed this. On the left, as you can see, there's a great deal of T2 hyperintensity in the cerebellar peduncles bilaterally. In addition, uh, many of these lesions were enhancing, as you can see on the post gadolinium image on the right. When seen sagittally, you can see the extent to which the cerebellum and the peduncles have been involved. You can also see new T2 hyperintense lesions radiating perpendicularly out of the, uh, away from the ventricle, uh, very indicative of a Dawson's fingers. This is an axial view of some of those new lesions that have also formed. In addition, the patient had a cervical spine MRI, which demonstrated a new partial myelitis uh, as you can see here on the axial image, uh, there's a T2 hyperintensity off to the left, and you can see on the sagittal image that there's a T2 hyperintensity between C2 and C3 uh, within the cervical spine. So again, unfortunately, this is not something that you'll see uncommonly in clinic, where you've placed somebody on a medication and now they've had uh, increased activity uh, on their MRI leading to uh, new symptoms. So the question uh, before us here is whether or not this is treatment failure, and if it is, what is your next clinical step? A, continue with glutarium or acetate for another three months, then repeat the brain MRI. B, change to high-dose, high-frequency interferon. C, change to natalizumab. D, change to an oral disease-modifying therapy. I think it's important to realize that there is not necessarily a correct answer to this question, though it is a very common dilemma that we face in multiple sclerosis centers almost every day. With the patient and her family, we had decided to give glutarium or acetate a few more months to become active, 
as in the pivotal trial, it took up to four to six months for there to be a statistically significant effect with this medication. Anecdotally, I have seen that this patient can become very that this medication can become very effective after three to four months of use, but a few weeks is just too early for this medication to be called a failure. In addition, uh, there's always risks and uh, benefits that need to be weighed when making a change to another disease-modifying therapy. After much discussion with the family and the patient, and especially owing to the fact that the patient had a great deal of fear about the risks of other medications, we stuck with glutaramor acetate. I had the patient and her family return three months later, and she returned to the clinic with continued nausea, lightheadedness, imbalance, and headache. Uh, She had had a pulse of steroids and felt that she was a little bit better. On on her exam, it was fairly unchanged from her prior visit visit with an EDSS at 2.5. However, the patient did also have a repeat brain MRI, and this is what it showed. As you can see, there is a much worse uh, lesion load here. The T2 hyperintense lesions are large uh, and involving a great deal of her brain here. Uh, and many more than there were before. You can also see on the axial T1 post-gadolinium images that many of these have that partial ring enhancement pattern demonstrating that this is active and aggressive multiple sclerosis. So I want to talk a little bit about clinical prognostic indicators. At this point, this young lady has had five clinical relapses in the first two years of her illness. What does this mean for the patient? So it turns out that in a seminal study on the epidemiology and natural history of multiple sclerosis, Dr. Weinshanker at the Mayo Clinic clearly showed that the number of attacks that a patient suffers in the first two years of the disease has a strong association with the long-term prognosis of those MS patients. This patient's already had five attacks, and that fact alone confers a very poor prognosis for this woman long-term. The outcome here in this trial was a DSS score of six. This was before we uh, went to the EDSS, which is the Expanded Disability Status Scale. But a six in the DSS still means that the patient required a cane to ambulate. So what this is trying to show is that if you look at that green line, a patient that's had five or more uh, clinical relapses within the first two years, on average, um, is going to need something to help them ambulate within 10 years However, if you can keep that attack rate uh, down to one attack in the first two years, that's the blue line, and you can buy these people a lot more time, up to, you know, 40 years before people uh, need to have uh, aid in ambulation. Are there other prognostic features that we can see just in clinic? And the answer is yes. There's a, a great deal of literature about this. And I think that these are worth keeping in your mind and and thinking about when you are uh, seeing a patient, the clinical predictor that can confer a good prognosis are that of Caucasian ethnicity, monofocal onset, onset with optic neuritis, or isolated sensory symptoms, a low relapse rate in the first two to five years, as we just discussed, good recovery after the first relapse. turns out that people who recover well from the first relapse tend to recover well from the second long interval between the first and the second relapse, no or low disability at five years, and a low lesion load on the abnormal MRI. So as you can see with this patient, her high lesion load, the fact that she is accumulating disability, the fact that she's having very short intervals between her relapse, the fact that she had um, a very high relapse rate in the first two years, and the fact that her onset was not optic neuritis, all bode poorly for this young lady. On the right side of this slide, you'll also see other factors that will lead to a poor prognosis, including non-white ethnicity, multifocal onset, onset with motor cerebellar or bowel and bladder symptoms, high relapse rate for the first two years, short inter-attack latency, disability at five years, abnormal MRI showing greater than or equal to two contrast-enhancing lesions, greater than or equal to nine T2 hyperintense lesions, and the presence of black holes on MRI. Vitamin D deficiency is is possible, and also the presence of intrathecal IgM oligoclonal bands, as discussed earlier.
These are all factors that we think of as being something that we can utilize to determine whether or not somebody is going to go on to have a poor prognosis. And this becomes important when talking about sequencing medications and when to escalate someone to another medication. So with this patient, going back to this case, what's the next clinical step? She's now had five lesions, very short interattack latency. She's accumulating disability. Do we continue with uh, high-dose, uh, high-frequency interferon or with clotiramiracetate? Do we change to an oral agent? Do we change to natalizumab? Do we change to mitoxantrone? Or do we change to an off-label immunosuppressant? And the answer here is C, D, or E, and I'm going to talk about why. There was a study done by Castillo, Trevino, and colleagues that demonstrated that when somebody was on traditional injectable disease-modifying therapies, uh, if you continue them on that therapy, their annualized relapse rate changes very little. However, when you change them from those disease-modifying therapies to natalizumab, there is a great reduction in the annualized relapse rate, as you can see here in the second column. Immunosuppressants work just as well at dropping the annualized relapse rate, as you can see in this third column. And the immunosuppressants utilized in this trial included cyclophosphamide, mitoxantrone, mycophenolate mofetil, and methotrexate. The number you see there on the right is the number of patients involved in this trial, which led to this result. In addition, there was another trial by Dr. Putsky and his colleagues, which demonstrates that before natalizumab on injectables and then a change to natalizumab, confers a very uh, significant change in the annualized relapse rate. And what's interesting here is that these four columns on the left are divided only by how long the patient has had the illness, zero to four years, four to six years, six to 10 years, or greater than 10 years. And even if a patient has been on uh, disease-modifying therapy for 10 years, there can still be a drastic change in the annualized relapse rate when changing to natalizumab. This image here on the right would demonstrate that with the change to natalizumab, up to 80% of patients would go on to have no relapses in the next year. So here's the problem. When you talk about this particular patient, it's very clear that the evidence would suggest I should put her either on natalizumab or an immunosuppressant. However, there is an increase in risk, and you have to remember that this is a 19-year-old young girl uh, who's just starting out her life, the idea of natalizumab leading to a 1% risk of a fatal brain infection called progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy is terrifying to her. Mycophenolate mofetil has a 1% lifetime risk of leukemia. Cyclophosphamide can lead to infertility, not to mention interstitial cystitis and all the other common side effects associated with this medication. And mitoxantrone is known to cause irreversible cardiomyopathy, and it has a risk of leukemia as well that approaches 1%. So talking about risk with this patient was really important. When we talk about natalizumab, the JC virus antibody is becoming a very uh, important um, topic to know about. About 55% of people on the planet have been exposed to the JC virus, which means that they have antibodies against it. So 55% of people are going to be JC virus antibody positive. If the JC virus antibody is negative, the risk of going on to develop progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy while on Tysabri is approximately 1 in 10,000. In theory, it should be zero, but there is a 2.2% false negative rate, and as such, the risk is approximately 1 in 10,000. There has been one case where a patient was uh, JC virus negative, then went on to be JC virus positive, and then went on to develop uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy within 9 to 12 months. As such, the FDA does recommend that you repeat this test every six months because even if somebody is negative now, they can still be exposed to this virus because uh, it is still in the environment. If somebody is JC virus antibody positive, the risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy after being on Tysabri for two years approaches 1%. If the J patient is JC virus antibody positive, there is a new titer available, and that titer would demonstrate uh, a little bit further what the risk might be for somebody who is positive but probably needs to be on this medication. If the titer is higher than 1.5, the risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy goes up uh, significantly and, as above, approaches 1%. However, if the titer is low, below 0.9, the risk is approximately 1 in 1,000 and this risk might be a little bit more palatable to a patient um, and important to realize if it is not that low. So with this patient, despite a great deal of objection, 
she did start an atalizumab. And for the next two years, she did not have another attack. The very next uh, semester, she went back to college and got straight A's and was able to regain function in her hand where she could go back to playing the guitar as her imbalance and incoordination started to improve. She currently lives with a daily risk of progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy given her JC-positive antibody status. But given the severity of her multiple sclerosis, the risk of her disease to her seems to be higher than the risk of PML. The learning points here are that there are a number of known clinical prognostic indicators that we can use to help us determine who will have aggressive illness, who will have a poor prognosis, and can help us to, to know when we need to be more aggressive in our treatment strategy for a particular patient with multiple sclerosis. It's also of note that safety and risk profiles are becoming a very large part of the discussion we have with our patients when weighing the risks and benefits of treatment. The JC virus antibody test can be a very helpful tool in managing the risk of progressive, multi, uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. But I think it's very key here to remember that as MS continues to progress, the risk-benefit equation can change. And just because we've decided that this wasn't the right medication in the past because the risk is too high doesn't mean that that is not something that needs to be readdressed in the future if the risk-benefit ratio changes. As this woman's disease progressed, we needed to be more aggressive, and that required us to now take a better evaluation of what the risks actually were and what the benefit could have been. She now has her life back, and that is worth taking the risk. Case number three. A 52-year-old African-American woman with an acute onset of left lower extremity weakness presents to your clinic. And the story is that in March of 2010, she was using the restroom. She sat down on the toilet and then was unable to get back up. Using her arms and legs, she pulled herself into the shower and noticed that she did not feel any water on her left leg. About an hour later, she had numbness and tingling in the left hand, and at that point, she reported to the emergency department. She states that by the time she got to the emergency department, all of the hand symptoms had abated, and they had only lasted about 30 minutes. But she was admitted to the hospital, and after an imaging study, was told that she had multiple sclerosis, and after a few days, was released with most of her strength regained. The sensory changes in her leg had not improved, but she was sent to the neurology clinic with a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis uh, and was told to discuss treatment options with her neurologist. She presents with this MRI. As you can see here on the left, this is a sagittal T2 image of the brain, and you can see that there are T2 hyperintensities that radiate out of the ventricle. Uh, in a perpendicular fashion consistent with Dawson's fingers. But you can also notice here on the axial image that there's uh, a lot of deep white matter, uh, sort of confluent white T2 change. So question number five is this. This patient presents with uh, this story and with this MRI. What do you do next? A, start a disease-modifying therapy. B, perform spinal cord imaging. C, wait six months and repeat a brain MRI. D, obtain additional history and perform a thorough neurologic exam. So a tip from my mentor is that D is always the correct answer. So I'll just pass that on to you. We know very little about this young woman uh, other than her MRI and a little bit of history from the ER. It's concerning, uh, especially the MRI, but it's by no means definitive. And you can never go wrong with more information, especially when you're talking about history and examination. So additional history, she's allergic to penicillin. Her medications include amlodipine, lisinopril, clonidine, aspirin, tramadol, gabapentin, methadone, hydrocodone, cyclobenzapine. Her review of systems demonstrates that she has cramping pain in the legs, neck and back pain that is significant and has been chronic, weakness and numbness in both hands, frequent urinary tract infections, urinary hesitancy, and frequent nocturia. Her past medical history is significant for hypertension, hepatitis C, and chronic low back pain. She is G11P8 with one miscarriage and two abortions. All of her eight children were born vaginally. She has a uh, prior history of a right lumpectomy in 62 and again in 66. In, uh, from a social history point of view, she retired from the Postal Service due to chronic back pain. Uh, she has a 10-year 10-pack uh, year history of smoking abuse, but she did quit in 1988. However, she does say it, that in her past, she's, quote, tried it all, including IV drugs, cocaine, meth, and uh, alcohol. She has a family history with a father who died at 71 of throat cancer, a mother 
who was currently 97 years old and healthy and currently taking no medications, and one brother who died of a myocardial infarction in his 50s. On exam, her blood pressure was 128 over 78, heart rate was 62, respiratory rate was 14. She was fairly pleasant and appropriate, able to provide a history. Her oropharynx was moist and clear. She had no carotid bruise. Her lungs were clear. Her cardiovascular exam was uh, normal. Her abdomen was soft, non-tender, non-distended. She had normal bowel sounds. On her extremities, she had numerous scars and a linear distribution over the dorsal aspect of both uh, hands, uh, forearms, as well as uh, very dry skin. There was no clubbing or cyanosis or edema. But on her neurologic exam, uh, she was appropriate. She did have slightly slowed responses. Um, normal language, however, and she had an intact short memory testing uh, at, at five minutes. Uh, visual acuity was 20-25 bilaterally on near card evaluation. She had no afferent pupillary defect, no disc pallor. Facial strength was full, but she did have a decreased left nasal label fold on the left. Uh, left. Uh, coordination revealed a positive Romberg test, but otherwise intact uh, cerebellar testing. The reflexes were two plus and symmetric, but decreased at the right ankle and absent at the left ankle. And there was a flexor response to Babinski testing. Her motor evaluation was significant for increased tone in the lower extremities with mild spasticity. In the upper extremities, she had a left pronator drift. There was also moderate weakness in the bilateral uh, lower extremities with the following distribution, four plus out of five in the right hamstrings four plus out of five on the right tibialis anterior, four minus out of five strength at the EHL. On the left, she had four plus strength at the gastrocnemius, but otherwise was intact. On sensory evaluation, she had mildly diminished temperature, light touch, uh, sensation in the left, upper, and lower extremities, but this was kind of an Apache distribution and was not highly reliable. Her gait was such that she had mild circumduction of that right leg, with the right foot drop, and she was un unable to walk on her heels owing to that right foot drop. In addition, she was unable to walk on her toes because when she would stand on that left toe, it would fall, demonstrating the gastrocnemius weakness. She also had difficulty with tandem gait. Of note, the patient did come with a lumbar puncture that had been performed in the hospital, which demonstrated two white blood cells, zero red blood cells, 178 protein, 58 glucose, uh, no oligoclonal bands, and a normal IgG index. Of note here is this protein. That's an exceptionally high CSF protein and one that is very, very odd for multiple sclerosis. So I guess just going back and thinking about this patient, the idea is, well, what is consistent with MS? What is not consistent with MS? She does have a pyramidal distribution of weakness in the right leg with flexor weakness but extensor preservation. She does have left arm and leg numbness. Uh, although that is patchy, it is there. Uh, she has bladder symptoms. She also has an abnormal MRI that is suggestive of MS, given the Dawson finger appearance of the lesions radiating out of the ventricular uh, part of the brain. Somewhat inconsistent with multiple sclerosis would be the very elevated CSF protein. Numbness and weakness in the hands were in a median distribution, and she had a left-sided gastrocnemius weakness, which is not in keeping with the central nervous system lesion. In addition, she has dropped ankle reflex, and she has chronic neck and back pain. Based on this information, we ordered an MRI of her uh, cervical spine and her lumbar spine, and we also ordered an EMG and nerve conduction study. Of note, when we did look at the original MRI, if you look down up here at the corpus callosum in the middle of the brain, what you'll see is there is a nice little T2 lesion, again, in keeping with the Dawson finger. However, if you extend down to the cervical spine and look at the area of C4-5, you can see that there's a very tight stenosis of the uh, cervical spine. So on the cervical spine MRI, what you actually see is that there's T2 hyperintense change at that level in the cord. And on an axial image, you can say that that is a very tight stenosis. On the lumbar spine, you can also see that there is significant um, degenerative joint disease here at the level of L4-5 and L5-S1. Particularly at the level of L4-5, on the axial image here, you can see that there is absolutely no room for this nerve to be leaving with severe neuroforaminal narrowing bilaterally. On EMG, a nerve conduction study of the upper extremities, 
The patient had evidence of bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome with severe right median neuropathy at the wrist, moderate left median neuropathy at the wrist, and this was uh, indicated by reduced amplitude of the right median CMAP, absent bilateral median snaps, increase in the bilateral median distal motor latency, reduced right median motor nerve conduction velocity, a low density of fibrillation potentials in the right abductor pollicis brevis, an increased incidence of long-duration motor unit action potentials in the right abductor pollicis brevis, reduced recruitment of MUAPs in the right abductor pollicis brevis as well. She also had evidence of a chronic right C7 radiculopathy, an increased incidence of long-duration motor unit action potentials and uh, in the right triceps and flexor carpi radialis, and reduced recruitment of the motor unit action potentials in the right triceps and flexor carpi radialis. Lastly, the patient also had evidence in the lower extremity EMG and nerve conduction study of a subacute severe left S1 radiculopathy. On the EMG and nerve conduction study, it showed a low density of fibrillation potentials in the left gastrocnemius and biceps femoris muscle. Also, an increased incidence of long-duration motor unit action potentials in the left biceps femoris muscles. Also, reduced recruitment in the left gastrocnemius and biceps femoris muscles. I think a very key learning point here is this. People with multiple sclerosis still get other illnesses and injuries. And as such, not every neurologic symptom in an MS patient is going to be caused by multiple sclerosis. I have numerous stories about this, but this is very important to remember. Just because somebody has multiple sclerosis and the diagnosis is secured, now in this patient we're still working on that diagnosis. However, even if the diagnosis is secured, you want to trust your examination and think about the fact that this, this could be caused by something else. Carpal tunnel syndrome is incredibly common. Cervical radiculopathy and cervical stenosis are incredibly common. Lumbar radiculopathy is incredibly common. Peripheral neuropathy is incredible, incredibly common. All of these other neurologic complications can occur in patients who also have multiple sclerosis, and many of those are correctable, and you can help this patient greatly to improve their quality of life by detecting that and thinking outside the box and realizing that these patients could have other symptoms. Don't ever underestimate the value of your exam, and you should trust your exam. You spent a long time learning it, and it will serve you well, especially in these multiple sclerosis patients. Thank you for your time, and I hope that this was a beneficial uh, exercise in thinking about how to take care of multiple sclerosis patients. Thanks, Dr. West, for your thoughtful and worthwhile comments and for presenting these three illuminating cases. We are often presented with a patient with a single demyelinating event and the dilemma of what to do. Dr. West reviews for us the appropriate gathering of more data by looking at MRI of the brain and CSF results, both of which are critical in assessing the risk of going on to MS over time after a first event. He also discusses when treatment is not good enough and what options are open for our patients when a first-line treatment does not work well enough. I'll note that the term treatment failure is really undefined in MS, since none of the treatments we provide either a cure or a complete response. We would substitute the concept that we are treating to target, the target being trying to achieve an apparent disease-free status, both based on clinical relapses and MRI new lesion activity. While this may not be possible, at least it helps us guide therapy rather than just carrying on when our pharmacology is not packing the appropriate punch. Finally, in his last case, he reminds us that not all white matter change is MS and that common things such as carpal tunnel syndrome and spinal stenosis can be mimics of MS. We need to be ever vigilant that we are indeed taking our patients down the correct treatment road. I remind the residents we need to keep an open mind in all cases and need to be ready to alter our approach if things are not going according to plan, either diagnostically or therapeutically. Please remember to fill out your evaluations for CME credit, and thanks for participating in this segment of our MS Virtual Grand Rounds series.